Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Um, very pleased that we're having our um, Prilex Research Network um, event this afternoon. Today we've got Dr. Ibrahim Abraham um, here to talk to us about um, Truth and Reconciliation, South Africa and Victoria. I'd like to acknowledge that we're um, holding this Zoom meeting on um, the in traditional land um, and pay my respects to the elders. Um, I won't spend too much time introducing Ibrahim, um, except to say that he's uh, the Haynes Moore Research Fellow in Religious and Social Sciences in the Humanities Research Centre at the Australian National University. Um, some of you might know him from his time as a former convener of the Silent Project Study of Bigotry. Um, his book, Race, Class and Christianity in South Africa, Middle Class Minorities, will be published later this year by um, Routledge. And I'll pass things over to Ibrahim to um, talk about the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission and some implications for um, the Victorian TRC as well. We'll stop about 10 minutes or so um, before the end of the hour and take some questions for Ibrahim as well. So welcome Ibrahim, welcome everybody. Um, we look forward to what you have to say. Okay, thank you, uh, Melissa. And let me also acknowledge uh, the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past, present, and emerging. Um, let me get right uh, down to it. Um, a month ago, it was announced that Victoria would embark on a truth commission as part of the process of negotiating a treaty between the state government and indigenous Victorians represented by the First People's Assembly of Victoria, which was elected last year. So it's called the Uruk Justice Commission. Like other uh, truth commissions, it will investigate past human rights abuses and their contemporary impact. So while most of the information about the Europe Commission is provisional, there's some notable similarities and differences with other truth commissions held over the decades. In news reports last month, reference was made to the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which ran from 95 to 98. The age quoted Marsha Langton uh, that the South African TRC and the more focused Canadian TRC were models for the Victorian initiative. Now, the term reconciliation revealingly has been left out of, of this Victorian initiative. The emphasis is on um, the truth telling part of things. Unlike most other TRCs, the Victorian initiative is linked to a further later reconciliation process, in this case, the treaty negotiation. Now, although the South African TRC is the most famous truth commission, it's not the only or the first. There's been several dozen around the world. So I'm going to offer a, an overview of uh, some generic features of truth commissions. I'm going to discuss at length some of the features and complexities of the South African TRC. My focus is on some of the conceptual or the, or the puzzling aspects of confession and reconciliation. I'll make a few comparative comments along the way about what little has been revealed about that Victorian initiative. I have no special insight about that. I'm relying on what's been reported in the media and what's been uh, reported through the Victorian government and the First Peoples Assembly. Um, I'm going to draw on, uh, in particular on Desmond Tutu's record of the TRC called No Future Without Forgiveness, some of the critics of the TRC, also the work of, uh, of J.M. Kutsia, um, although I presented a, a lecture on him for the HRC uh, about a month ago, so I won't spend too much time on Kutsia. Um, and I promise not to bore you too much by talking about Foucault and uh, taxation. Let's begin um, with a very quick look at what is proposed for the Victorian initiative. Now, note the word proposed um, appears three times. It's still very tentative. They haven't even appointed the commissioners uh, yet. I think the, the call for commissioners only closed the day before yesterday. So it's very, very tentative. But here are some, some interesting features that, that I've highlighted, which we'll touch on in the presentation. Firstly, this idea of um, establishing an official record. Um, 
of the impact of colonization on First Peoples in Victoria. Now that's a, an intriguing and, and, and ambiguous word. So official for who or official for what purpose? Official for Victoria's First Nations people will be different than an official text for treaty negotiations. Each has implications as might, you know, if the intent is to create an official document for um, uh, 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 use in schools or in legal proceedings or, or so on. Now linked to this question is the emphasis here placed on truth telling. That's very common in these kinds of commissions and we'll talk more about that. What's not common what's not common at all is the expansive time frame, right? Uh, since colonization going all the way back to the 18th century. Usually truth commissions are very limited in the time period they investigate. That was certainly the case for South Africa. We do have to be aware though, that because there are around 50,000 uh, indigenous Victorians, that probably opens up possibilities for the commission that weren't there in the case of um, the South African TRC dealing with 40 or 50 million South Africans. So that might create more possibilities for expansiveness. Um, we also see here the final highlighted point here is that the uh, the, the Justice Commission will issue recommendations to the government. Again, very common in TRC. One interesting hint of what the commission uh, might do though, is review past reviews, report on reports, make recommendations about recommendations. So it won't simply be first uh, person, uh, First Nations testimony. So I want to, uh, in a sense, zoom out, discuss TRCs in general, and then uh, we'll, we'll zoom in again on, uh, on, on South Africa. Now, TRCs are, are especially concerned with state violence or political violence, particularly uninvestigated or, or unexplained deaths and disappearances. Truth commissions usually make recommendations to the state, often the same state that carried out the violence, even if it's a transformed or a transition in state. Um, uh, uh, truth commissions often make recommendations to newly democratic governments. So a term that's synonymous with truth commissions is transitional justice. The legal scholar Pierre Hazan has, um, he's compared the process of transitional justice or truth commissions to purgatory. Um, they're both liminal places, they're in between places. And like the medieval invention of purgatory, Hazan argues that, um, you know, this development in the 1990s of transitional justice, of, of truth and reconciliation commissions, really changed the conceptual landscape uh, of, of, of the time because it was creating something really quite new. Now, this isn't really the case in Victoria, interestingly enough, again, because there's been no fundamental constitutional shift, which there was, for example, in South Africa or in Germany, in, in, in Chile, up, up here we see as well, before the, uh, the commissions uh, then. Now, the reason why truth commissions make recommendations, one reason is they're not criminal courts. Um, in a lot of cases, the events they investigate may not have been subject to criminal law, but later start to be seen as unjust. Another reason they make recommendations is they're usually temporary institutions, right? They're, they're, they're liminal, you know, in between um, uh, institutions. Some get extended. Um, sometimes they have to rush and they make errors and omissions. That's probably the case in South Africa. Um, the first one I have up here is, is Chile, the National Commission on Truth and Reconciliation held in 1990 after the transition out of military dictatorship. It's one of the first, one of the first major truth commissions, not the first though, and it investigated murders and disappearances during the military dictatorship between 1973, that first, uh, you know, 9-11, and 1990 recommending compensation and human rights focused reforms, right? Very standard for TRCs uh, in, in the later decades. In the introduction to the English language edition of the Chilean report, it asks the question, how can the equally necessary but often conflicting objectives of justice and social peace be harmonized? 
Now, um, in, in the Chilean case, um, what this, this really points to is the fact that um, after the Pinochet military dictatorship, and then a few years later in South Africa after apartheid, um, when repressive forces move aside, power is handed over to a democratic government. In other words, if power is handed over to a democratic government, power is not seized in some revolution or some war. So the members of the old regime and their supporters, but you know, the members as well, are still around. They're not vanquished, they're not humiliated, you haven't thrown them all in prison, you haven't sent them to the guillotines. They're still around, they still have interests, they still have rights which have to be respected. Pinochet, you know, for example, he was arrested in, in London in 1998, that's eight years after the Chilean uh, TRC began. For eight years he was head of the military, right? He's, he's, he's out there, he's living his life. In the South African context, um, the Nuremberg style kind of mass trials that followed World War II um, were, were impossible. They were considered, some people agitated for that. They wanted the whole apartheid government to be put on trial and sent to prison. Um, Desmond Tutu, he explains that after World War II, when Germany was comprehensively defeated, quote, the victors could kick the vanquished even, they, even as they lay on the ground and they didn't have to account for crimes by their own side. Um, there could be conversely no victor's justice is the term Tutu uses in South Africa because neither side won a decisive victory which would enable them to do so. Instead, there was a negotiated compromise in South Africa leading to a new constitution. And the journalist Alastair Sparks, perhaps the, the, one of the finest journalists in, in, uh, in, in, in modern South African history, certainly one of the, 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 the leading authorities of that late apartheid period, he points out the threat of a Nuremberg-style trial would have just wrecked the negotiations. Why would the leadership of the National Party, they were in government before 94, they instituted and then dismantled apartheid, they were part of the, the, the coalition government for a little while under Mandela after 94, why would they negotiate to put themselves in prison? Um, so reconciliation as healing relationships in truth and reconciliation commissions is partly about making space for members and supporters of the old regime in the new society. Not necessarily unconditionally, but not uh, you know, as, as subjugated or humiliated either. Right, again, this is the, the challenge that the Chilean report identified, adjudicating between the often conflicting, conflicting objectives of, tr of justice and social peace. Now, the final example before moving on to South Africa is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, focused specifically on Indigenous students at residential schools. There are at least 150,000 uh, residential students over the years, often neglected or abused in under-resourced schools, which provided poor education. Um, now, 94 recommendations were issued covering a range of things, uh, education, justice, immigration, uh, childcare, families, and so on. I think they reported in, nine, in 2015. Um, the commission linked truth and reconciliation in a revealing way. And looking at, at one of the commission's key statements, we can start to think about truth and reconciliation as a narrative. Uh, here we have, to the commission, reconciliation is about establishing and maintaining a mutually respectful relationship between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal peoples in this country. In order for that to happen, there has to be awareness of the past, acknowledgement of the harm that has been inflicted, atonement for the causes, and action to change behaviour. We'll see variations of this language repeat itself. Uh, th th throughout the, the paper, because it's a very good example of that narrative of, of truth and reconciliation. Now, in South Africa, constituted in 1995, the South African Truth and Reconciliation, it's overseen by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Uh, he, he, you see him uh, handing over the reports to, to Mandela. 
Uh, the deputy uh, or, or, or was uh, Alex Borain, who was the former president of the Methodist Church and a former anti-apartheid parliamentarian. It heard the testimony of thousands of victims and perpetrators of human rights abuses, it, uh, as well as institutional representatives and some academics, and it reported in 1998. Its brief covered all aspects of politically motivated violence between 1960 and 1994. So politically motivated violence between 1960 and 1994, not mere, you know, criminality. Um, and it was criticized by some for this narrow focus, but it also later on in, in, in its process examined the broader context in which events occurred within, within limits though. Now, um, you know, one of the dissenting uh, uh, reports by one of the, the deputy uh, 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 commissioners, uh, 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 Vinan Mallon, who was a, a, a dissident National Party MP uh, and uh, an Africana, his uh, dissenting report begins by talking about his father in an internment camp in World War II. He talks about the poverty that many Afrikaners suffered during the Great Depression. He talks about Cecil Rhodes. He wonders, what, how, can you understand, how can you understand South Africa if you don't understand you know, British imperialism and colonialism? These are all good points, but you know, um, can you imagine what would have happened if the TRC wanted to go back to talk about, to investigate the Boer War? And, and, and the Afrikaners put in British concentration camps. You know, what I'm saying is that I don't think the TAC was willing to fully embrace the suffering of Afrikaners for political reasons, because they were on their way transitioning out of an Afrikaner chauvinist regime. And, 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 and Malin uh, critiqued that. Now, the TRC was very public in South Africa, unlike most before and, and some afterwards. There was a weekly TV show. Um, you can see all 87 episodes up on YouTube, hosted by Max Dupree, uh, a, 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 another a brilliant South African journalist. It showed testimony, it showed background information. Um, it, it showed some really very harrowing scenes. Um, in addition to the commission itself, those main hearings which took place around the country, there was a commission tasked with adjudicating claims for amnesty and also compensation. And the committee, the commission recognized compensation would have to be symbolic. It recognized the true cost of human rights abuses were literally and figuratively incalculable. For example, you know, if, you, if, you, if you take seriously the claims of um, you know, the liberal business lobby who claims that they were always anti-apartheid, they were always lobbying the government to change uh, the laws. Everyone in South Africa, black or white, was impoverished by the sheer inefficiency, the sheer idiocies of apartheid. So how are you going to calculate, you know, uh, if you're going to cal calculate compensation for everybody? How, how would you do that? Now, insisting on human rights as South Africa's new moral compass, the TRC made two clear arguments. Firstly, apartheid was a crime against humanity, and that has a relatively technical uh, meaning to it. It refers to the systematic nature of human rights abuses, murder, torture, relocation, so on and so on. The systematic nature, which some of the National Party leadership uh, denied and still deny to this day. Secondly, um, it, uh, the, the key argument or the outcome of the TRC was that opponents of apartheid also violated human rights, not just the apartheid government. Again, you know, as Tutu said, this was not Victor's justice, even if there were legitimate criticisms that, um, you know, the, 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 the TRC um, did not focus as much on political violence that took place between the ANC, Mandela's party, and its, and its rivals. Um, it was not Victor's justice. It, 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 you know, the, in, in many cases, uh, you know, ANC operatives, particularly from the armed wing, were condemned for, for human rights abuses, as well as, you know, apartheid uh, officials. Now, like other truth commissions, the TRC was not a court. Um, there were some conventional trials before, during, and after the TRC for apartheid era crimes. Um, 
that the cost and complexity of these criminal trials was in fact a motivation feature for the TRC. Tutu cites a few cases, including the prosecution of the former defense minister, General Magnus Mallon, which led to a not guilty verdict, but also the prosecution of a former security official, Eugene de Kock, which did return a guilty verdict, but in both cases, they, they took a long time and there were costly, so in, times of, in terms of, of, of time and money as well. And these trials illustrated a problem that reoccurred repeatedly throughout the TRC. Tangled lines of authority and, and the difficulty of locating ultimate guilt. You know, low-level police officers and soldiers claimed that they were following orders. Their superiors and the ministers insisted they had no control over a handful of overzealous cadre. The, uh, the former uh, uh, president, F.W. de Klerk, in particular, um, there was really quite stunning testimony he gave before the TRC. He begins by apologizing. He begins by apologizing for apartheid in, in its totality. He apologizes to everybody whose who's, who's, who's life was diminished. He says it was wrong. But what he's not apologizing for, what he's not claiming responsibility for, were the very things that the TRC were investigating. The deaths, the disappearances, the torture, the gross human rights abuses. He says that was not policy. That was never policy. In his dissenting report, uh, I, I mentioned Vinan Mallon, uh, the ex-national MP. He said something of the same thing about leadership within the Africana community. Um, this, this, this unwillingness to accept full, firm guilt and responsibility in some cases. He says, for example, church leaders said they believed what the MPs told them. But then the MPs said that they thought that they had the imprimatur of, of, of the church. It seems, you know, when you read his dissenting opinion that everybody was, no one was sincere in what they were doing. Everybody seems to have been slightly cynically going through the motions. And, and, and you know, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't sort of buy that. Um, the moral authority of the TSC was interesting because at times it put itself above the courts because it could grant amnesty in exchange for truth. Although ultimately it was subordinate to courts, um, judges refused to testify. And, uh, you know, I mentioned F.W. de Klerk, he sued the TRC through the regular court system, and they were obliged to expunge references to him from the final report. And, you know, arguably this is, uh, they hadn't fully worked through the, the, the legal ramifications of what it was that they were doing when they set up the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It wasn't entirely clear where the lines of, of, of legal authority were, were going, to, be, were going to, 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 to fall. Now, further to its difference from a court, TRC hearings, they were described as more like church services than trials. The deputy chair, Alex Borain, wrote that uh, it was a ritual deeply needed to cleanse a nation. It was a drama. The actors were in the main ordinary people with a powerful story. But this was no brilliantly written play. It was the unvarnished truth in all its starkness. The TRC hearings took what I, as a sociologist, would call a Durkheimian approach. They produced rituals full of collective effervescence. Um, and they were really designed to create and then again and again recreate a sense of a united moral community. They were really trying to, to, to create a new moral community. Um, so uh, these, these hearings, which occurred around the country, it, they were effectively saying again and again, this is who we are. This is where we came from. This is where we want to go. Uh, you know, and, and this was the process that was repeated, uh, you know, week after week, month after month during those hearings. Now, the TRC in its own report uh, says all the hearings were to have a ceremonial aspect. The chairperson's opening remarks were often preceded by prayer, by the lighting of a memorial candle, by hymns or songs. Some of these were spontaneous, some of them were not. Um, when 
Uh, Archbishop Tutu provided he wore his purple robes, lending his own special presence to the occasion. Now, the religious aspects of the hearings were sometimes criticized for its mainly Christian focus. Anshi Krog, um, who wrote the book, uh, uh, The Country of My Skull, um, noted the concern that Tutu had, quote, unambiguously mantled the commission in Christian language. And she notes that there was this uncertainty about, you know, is he over-exaggerating Black people's willingness to forgive as part of his, his own sort of Christian, Christian habitus, in a sense. But in a later book, um, Crow, uh, she admits that it was, it was actually really white South Africans who were unsettled by all this talk of forgiveness. They could understand demands for money. They could, they could understand demands for revenge. They didn't really understand, you know, forgiveness. It didn't, it didn't make a lot of sense. They, they were skeptical. Now, her, uh, she suggests that the Christian framework was necessary, but also some other people have said the same thing as well. They basically stumbled into this Christian drama of confession and forgiveness. And if you stumbled into this, this drama, this story, what are you going to do other than follow that logic through to its end? So, so uh, uh, Pete Myring, who's a, 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 a Dutch reformed theologian who's involved with the TRC, says, you know, uh, confession, forgiveness, atonement, you know, these are basically sort of religious concepts. If that's your framework, what are you going to do other than fill it with religious content? Otherwise, it's simply not really going to, to make much sense. Now, you see here, Crow describes Tutu um, as the compass of the TRC, that he, he, can, he can lead the, 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 the process through language. It shoots up like fire, wrought from a vision of where we must go from a grip on where we are now. And it's language that drags people along with that process. Right. It's, it, so it has that kind of narrative ambition. It drags people along. And again, recall Borain's quote that, you know, it was a drama. It was, it was a ritual. It was a drama. But it wasn't a brilliantly written drama. So it needed that narrative pull. It needed to, to, to drag people uh, along to where they wanted to go. Now, connected to this is the fact that TRC was not a criminal court. Because it was not a criminal court, it did not follow judicial norms when it came to truth telling. They followed the ideas of a South African jurist, Albie Sachs, um, and they, the TRC employed a particular idea of truth, what Sachs referred to as healing truth. A healing truth emphasizes human relationships. It acknowledges individual suffering with the aim of avoiding the repetition of that suffering and with the aim of making amends of some kind. Now, it seems to me that it assumes this idea of, of healing truth. It assumes that truth telling has some form of social power because in part it has some individual affective power. It has some emotional pull to it. A little like Tutu's language, it can drag you where you want to go, where you need to go. And the process of truth telling was very important for the TRC as well. Not just the final outcome, not just the final recommendation, the very process. The report argued the basic conduct of the commission sought to reflect uh, new norms of social relations between people, to be a model of respectful relationships. And, you know, it seems to me that this is going to be um, a similar approach in the vac that Victorian Uruk Commission, if you think I've forgotten about Victoria. Um, in the early statements that we have, it emphasizes the centrality of First Nations people's voices in the process. And I think this is perhaps where the influence of that South African um, uh, a tradition and the broader truth and reconciliation tr tradition from you know Chile onwards is is really influencing what's going on in Victoria. Now I want to talk a bit about um, uh, uh, bringing uh, uh, Jam Kutsia, the South African writer. Well, now he's a, an Australian writer. He lives in Adelaide. 
And I want to talk about the idea of confession and truth because as well as victims, the TRC heard from perpetrators of violence. And I think that's different from the Victorian proposal. It will have the power to compel testimony as a Royal Commission does. But it's not really going to be, there's no sense that, 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 that individuals will be, will, be, will be coming to testify as they did in, uh, individual perpetrators of rights abuses will be coming to, to testify as they did in, uh, in South Africa. So we're, we're going back to 1985, an essay by Kutsia. It's a decade before the TRC. And Kutsia examines the tropes of confession in literature and he explored the complexity of confession in secular context. Confession is just one part of a narrative. And again, recall the language of the Canadian TRC. You have awareness and acknowledgement. That's, you know, it seems to me to constitute confession. Then atonement and action to bring change. Um, or to change behavior. Now, as Kutsia writes a bit more traditionally, making reference to, uh, to St. Augustine, confession is part of a sequence of transgression, confession, penitence, and absolution. And it's absolution that provides what he calls liberation from the oppression of memory. It is the indispensable goal of all confession, sacramental or secular. Now, Tutu agrees with this narrative nature of confession, um, the narrative nature of confession, contrition, and forgiveness or, ab or absolution. But theologically, Tutu allows them to be rearranged. Tutu allows, and in fact, this is what happens in the TRC in some cases. Forgiveness can proceed, not confession, but forgiveness can proceed contrition. Again, with, with Crow's language that, that Tutu's, with, with, with Crow's description of Tutu's language dragging people, dragging people to where they need to go, Tutu's view is that forgiveness can push the story forward in his Christian approach. Forgiveness can compel contrition. But in a secular context without a confessor who can absolve the confessant, so traditionally a priest can, 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 uh, uh, offers absolution to someone who comes and confesses, or some sort of authorizing discourse equivalent to what you have in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, where Jesus uh, tells the man he's healed, your sins are forgiven, go home. In other words, you know, it's, not a, it's not an Australian go home, which is a you're drunk, go home. It's a your, your relationships have been healed, go home, go back to your community. If you don't have that, if you don't have that discourse that your, your go home, your relationships have been healed, go, go home, go back to your community, go back to your life. If you don't have that, you know, Kutsia wants to know, what is the actual end point of, of confession? What is the end point of a secular confession without that, without that possibility of, of forgiveness and absolution? Um, and he realizes that the same question is true for a novel of self-discovery or a novel of self-examination. And to an extent, his book, uh, Disgrace, which, which I talked about uh, for the HRC, and hopefully it'll pop up on YouTube uh, 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 before too long. Um, um, you have this same problem in a novel of self-examination or discovery like Disgrace. How does a story find an end for itself? How does it find an end for itself without the intervention of grace in the world? And without the possibility of absolution, of forgiveness, confession for Kutsia can become an endless process. What he calls a regression to infinity of self-awareness and self-doubt. During on Dostoevsky, Kutsia refers to hyper-consciousness. It's an endless awareness of awareness that becomes crippling because any possible belief, any possible action is always subject to endless scrutiny. And the philosopher Susan Wolf calls this moral sainthood. It's the denial of pleasure in life, absent moral and often political perfection. If you turn this denial of, of pleasure in, in an imperfect world outward, not inward, 
you actually, I think, come up with something close to the, what, what Sarah Ahmed calls the kiln joy, the subject who refuses pleasure, who refuses to get along in a morally compromised world. Now, this idea, a form of hyper-consciousness is locatable in a, a controversial essay by the South African philosopher Susan Weiss called um, How Do I Live in This Strange Place, which comes from an Afrikaans reggae song, underappreciated genre of music. Um, and it's a critique of, of South African whiteness. Um, the, the essay and the, and the song, actually. Um, it advocates white political, essentially abstentionism or quietism. The idea is that awareness of one's whiteness as a kind of privilege that um, provincializes and corrupts your view of life um, leads to a kind of um, shameful inaction. But, but Wolf thinks this is probably the way things have to be, at least for a while. The argument is that um, if, if your perspective on life is, is, is inescapably privileged and corrupt, do you have anything positive to contribute to public discourse? Or should you retreat into, into political quietism? That's, that's Wolf's argument. But Kutsia offers uh, what, he recall, what he calls an allegory of, of grace in the form of charity. And charity is compassionate being with. It's not a, a translation of grace, it's an allegory of grace, maybe a pointer. And the allegory of grace offers that possible absolution could see of things. If I look back at my own fiction, and he's thinking in particular of a book that he wrote in the late apartheid era uh, called Age of Iron. If I look back at my own fiction, I see a simple standard erected. That standard is the body. Whatever else, the body is not that which is not. And the proof that it is, is the pain it feels. The body with its pain becomes a counter to the endless trials of doubt. The end of that hyper-consciousness that I mentioned, the end of that moral sainthood and its political inaction. So not grace then, Kutsia writes, but at least the body. Let me put it baldly. In South Africa, it is not possible to deny the authority of suffering and therefore the body. It is not that one grants the authority of the suffering body. The suffering body takes this authority. That is its power. We might say the suffering body pulls you or drags you to, to where you need to go. So to make a, a short argument long, that I think is where truth lay in the TRC, in suffering bodies. But not only the victims, because there were plenty of perpetrators of violence who spoke about the impact that it had on them. You know, it, it, I don't have any, thankfully, experience of either, but I don't doubt for a moment that it, that it, that it messes you up. And there were plenty of cases of people testifying about that, about you know, broken relationships, broken lives, as, as the consequence of, of their... Uh, state-sanctioned violence. The assumption was that, like Kutsia uh, identifies here, the suffering body has moral authority. And I wonder if this is going to be an approach that the Victorian initiative takes. I wonder if that could be its moral register because you're not really going to have confessions of moral wrongdoing. And I'm not sure if like South Africa, that kind of um, you know, Christian narrative would work in a context like Victoria. Um, I think you will get corporate confessions when, when they start to call institutions to account, especially from institutions like churches that have already worked through these issues. I don't think you're going to get those confessions of individual wrongdoing in that Victorian case, though. So I wonder if this is then going to be, if it's going to be suffering that anchors the commission with all the, 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 the issues that it then throws up. It's not necessarily a, 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 a solution. It creates more problems. 
as, as many solutions do. You know, should it be public then, the way the South African institution was? Now, um, all right, we've, we've got sort of 10 minutes or, 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 or so. So um, I, I <laughs> want to talk a bit about Foucault and taxation. Um, I spent, before I, I, I came to work at the ANU, I spent five years at the University of, of Helsinki. And the Finns are an agreeable, agreeably taxable people. So perhaps that influenced my, my view of things. Um, a few things to say about, about confession. In Foucault's, uh, the first volume of his History of Sexuality, um, he associates the solidification of the obligation to confess in uh, the Counter-Reformation. Um, and after this point, you're not just supposed to confess your transgressions, but your desires. And what he calls your truth obligations to acknowledge ideas and events uncovers the truth about thoughts as well as actions. And he, as he says, it leads to an obligation to bear public or private witness against oneself. So in the legal system, a criminal's inner being, their environment constitutes what Foucault calls the shadows lurking behind the case. So although the TRC focused on individual actions, the later hearings focus on broader social context. Uh, a quote here from the report, without some sense of antecedent circumstances, factors and context within which gross violations of human rights occurred, it is almost impossible to understand how over the years, people who considered themselves, considered themselves ordinary, decent, God-fearing, found themselves turning a blind eye to a system which impoverished, oppressed and violated the lives and very existence of so many of their fellow citizens. Now, in spite of uh, emphasizing and demonstrating that victims were part of widespread social experience, that was part of the utility of individual um, victims' testimony. They realized that they weren't suffering some unique uh, experience, that it was something that the rest of their country went through, and, and that was seen to have power. Um, it compelled also institutional self-reflection but even though there was that desire to link the individual instances with the broader social and historical context, the TRC was criticized for its individual focus on victims and perpetrators rather than systematic issues. For example, the notion of racial capitalism. And this would take us back as, as the dissenting uh, uh, deputy Violet Mallon said, go back to talk about Cecil Rhodes and so on. Another of the leading critics of the TRC in this regard was another Africana, the economist Sampi Terra Blanche. And you get a sense when you read Terra Blanche that here is a man who is frustrated with the kind of folk theodicy, the explanations for suffering and the justifications of wealth that he would have encountered in his own community. And he criticizes the reductionist individualism of white South Africans. They were more concerned with whether they were morally opposed to apartheid than whether they actually benefited from the systematic nature of apartheid. Now, along with the limited historical scope, which I've mentioned, the refusal to examine systematic or ideas of collective, controversially collective guilt, constitutes a limit to the breadth and depth of self-reflection in the TRC. And remember, this is, that is precisely what confession is, is, is supposed to oblige you to do. To, 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 to be thorough, you know, uh, 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 about your desires and about your, your, your life world. Now, Terra Blanche argues by failing to present whites as whites, as beneficiaries of the economic system of apartheid, and blacks as blacks, as victims of that same system, the TRC undermined any sense that white South Africans have what he called a moral obligation to atone for their past practices. And for an economist, he's, he's, he's very sort of theological. Um, and, uh, you know, atonement was also a word used in the Canadian TRC, but it was not required individually or collectively um, in the South African context. Now, Tutu at the time and over the years wondered whether some sort of reparation should have been necessary for amnesty or at least contrition. And this is problematized in, uh, in Kurtz's uh, 
uh, novel uh, disgrace, which uh, you know asks the question: Can you compel contrition? Um, sometimes the the the, the most uh, you know affecting forms of contrition are, are spontaneous. There was a, a case of a of a of a, a, a former high ranking uh, you know police officer who turns up at the office of the former head of the Council of Churches, Frank Shikane, who was then the chief of staff of uh, President Thabo Mbeki, refuses to leave until uh, 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 Chikane lets him wash his feet in an act of contrition. Now, you, you imagine that you are uh, Shikane's secretary and you have to tell him, sir, there is this owned police officer and he refuses to leave until he lets you wash his feet. Sir, can you come and deal with it? He's making us all uncomfortable, sir, please. And that led to a whole, uh, you know, national public uh, uh, debate unsatisfactorily, uh, you know, uh, ended by the way of that individual act of, of, of contrition. Tutu acknowledges the government was probably right not to demand on con contrition in return for amnesty because who in fact would believe it if it was, if it was an obligation. Now, uh, on the, uh, the matter of atonement, the TRC re received numerous suggestions for wealth taxes. But again, it, like the Victorian Commission, it was only going to issue broad recommendations. So it simply said that the government should give urgent consideration to harnessing all available resources in the war against poverty. Um, now, wealth tax was not implemented in South Africa. Tutu revived the debate in 2011. Referencing some of the ideas raised before the TRC, there are a whole bunch of, of, of different ideas, but making specific reference to white South Africans, which was merely implicit in the 1990s, because this was before you had a, 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 a small and, and, and ground black bourgeoisie in South Africa. Um, but in the same speech in 2011, in which Tutu raises this question of, of a wealth tax, he goes on to talk about, uh, about corruption which is a very obvious reason why you would be reluctant to pay, uh, you know, additionally, if, if, you, if you don't have, the, ob if you don't have the, the confidence that the government will use this wisely. Um, Tutu suggested even a quite piffling wealth tax would be an extraordinary symbol of white South Africans' readiness to embrace reconciliation. If they asked to be taxed or, or willingly over-contributed, and I'm kind of reminded of a point that Pierre Bourdieu makes in his book on class distinction. The bourgeoisie, he said, you know, it's, it's most bourgeois, it's most sort of free and privileged when it turns against its own interests in the name of some higher or, or abstract value. And, and he clarified these statements and Tutu said technically he wasn't calling for a tax on whites, that would be illegal, but he was hoping that um, uh, uh, it could be a gesture of generosity. And you know, it strikes me that um, that what uh, Tutu and, and Tara Blanche in calling for these sort of wealth taxes were actually calling for. And you see here Tara Blanche's, uh, you know, narr narrative um, about the symbolic value of such a wealth tax without a clear understanding of the systematic nature of the exploitation that has taken place, it would also not be possible for the beneficiaries, i.e. many whites, to make the necessary confession, to show the necessary repentance, to experience the necessary conversion, and to be prepared to make the needed sacrifices. Right? That's very similar again to that Canadian CRC language, right? Awareness, acknowledgement, atonement, and action. Action for Terra Blanche here is, is, is conversion though. Now, um, there were practical reasons for this limitation on, on the TRC and, and the reason to avoid any sense of collective guilt. Mandela in particular was insistent that there should be no sense that Afrikaners were collectively in the dock, that the Afrikaner in general was being called to account. Right? This is the precise opposite of what you know, Terra Blanche calls for. Terra Blanche wants his own people, and to an extent as well, uh, Angie Krogh does as well, wants his own people to be collectively called to account. He wants this process of confession and conversion. Um, Mandela wanted Afrikaners to feel a sense of individual and collective belonging in South Africa. Pride could be collective. Shame had to be individual. 
And, you know, the last thing I'll say here is that um, what Tutu and Terry Blanche were ultimately trying to do was to get uh, South Africans to think about taxation in a quasi-religious manner, in the same community-focused ritual manner that the TRC conducted its hearings. That, in this sense, taxation would function as a form of social solidarity, allowing taxpayers to reassert their membership of a moral community. It could be a common investment in the relief of that suffering body that Kutsia takes to be the only feasible moral authority in South Africa. And I think we're running out of time, so I will, I will leave that there and, and hand things back over to, uh, to, to Melissa. Great. Thanks, Ibrahim. Um, I didn't explain before, but if anyone has any questions for Ibrahim, you can go to the Q&A pop-up box at the... Um, at the bottom of your screen there and um, put, your, put your question in. I'll pose them to Ibrahim. Um, we do have a, a comment there from uh, Ed Wensing says, um, what a great presentation, lots to discuss and explore before another jurisdiction sets off on treaty discussions. Um, in that context, he recently called for truth and healing commission in the ACT, given that the ACT government has committed to treaty discussions with traditional owners. Um, I think that Ed's comment there, I guess, brings up a question that you posed yourself, I think, at the beginning of this presentation, which was, what is um, you know, a, a truth-telling process like this a, a precursor to, in terms, you know, what does it say about the, the relationship of, of truth-telling to um, the relationship between the, the state and Indigenous peoples, First Nations peoples? Um, I guess, what, what is the, is it, that doesn't have a symbolic kind of function there. Why are we looking at a you know, truth-telling sort of process like this one, rather than, I guess, the more familiar structures, like, um, let's say, a Royal Commission that, you know, that we, we often use for these sorts of things. What, what are your thoughts there? It, it is very interesting because, I mean, I, specifically on the ACT thing, I think that you're going to have uh, a lot of states and the AC uh, and, and perhaps, you know, federally as well, sitting back to see what the Victorian process works out. There's going to be a lot of process, a lot of scrutiny on uh, the, 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 the Victorian, the Euro Commission, uh, because it will probably be that model for, for what the other states do. It is very interesting because, you know, I, I mentioned that one of the key features of most TRCs is that investigative element. Um, in the South African TRC, it uncovered some really shocking things. Um, you know, Tutu refers to it as almost sort of James Bond style intrigues that were, that were going on. I mean, there were genuine military secrets, genuine secret police secrets, genuine secrets of KGB trained guerrillas. You don't get the same sense that this is what the Victorian Commission is aiming for. They're aware that the information is out there. But it's not necessarily told from that perspective on my interpretation of what little I've seen of it. It's not necessarily uh, uh, being presented through that narrative of, of the suffering of, of the first Victorians. I, I think that's perhaps what the, the, the specific truth telling aspect is going to be. Now, it's going to be very tricky, I think, to, to see how you move from that process to that next stage of, of the treaty. Uh, that, 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 is simply, that is simply not clear. That, you know, to, to a certain extent, you know, the, the, the commissioners are doing us, a, 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 the country, a great service. As, 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 the, as the, you know, the TRC commissioners did in, in, in South Africa by working through some of these processes. Um, but I think certainly that, that focus on, on, on the suffering of, 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 of First Nations people, it's a reorientation, it's a retelling of that story with a different understanding of truth, aware that there is actually a lot of information out there that, that scholars might be aware of, the policymakers might be aware of. Are ordinary Victorians aware of it? I'm, I'm not sure. So um, I guess the, the public nature of the, the revelations that something like this might come up. And I guess that also goes towards that, what you're talking there about taxation um, in terms of you know, what can you use a process like this to, you know, to justify? What kind of conversations can that lead to in terms of questions about justice? 
And that's one of the fascinating things about, you know, TRCs, they begin in this sort of, you know, ritualistic manner as a sort of a spiritual outpouring. But at the end of the day, they're going to get down to these, the banalities of modern life. Even if they recommend only broad uh, policies to the Victorian government, um, the, these sort of questions are, are, are going to come up. And it's, 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 it's that process, uh, how, how, how you move uh, in, uh, in, 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 in that way that, uh, that is very important. Um, yes, there was, there was something else you said in there, but I, but I've, but I've, I wanted to comment on, but I've, I've sort of lost it. That's okay. Perhaps we'll come back to it. I have a question here from Janet Hunt. Um, she says, we had a partial truth telling with the bringing them home report. Have you looked at that process in terms of some of these ideas you are presenting? So she also refers to prior truth telling um, processes that we've had here in Australia. No, I've, I've not. My focus is very much on, on, uh, on, on South Africa, but there are a great many. Um, I, I, if I go back to my, to my, uh, can I do it? Go back to my first slide here. On the United States Institute of Peace, you've got a digital library with a great many um, records of, of, of truth telling um, of, uh, events from around the world. Large and small, some of the most interesting ones are the very small ones. There was a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in the town of Greensboro, North Carolina in 1999. If, if, if uh, you know, if you've seen the, the, the TV show Parks and Recreation, it was on that level. It was local government. It was making recommendations about local museums. It was making recommendations about, you know, council policy and so on. Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, they don't have to be grand national events. They can be, they can be relatively intimate because ultimately the reconciliation part of it is about relationships. And you can conceive of relationships as, as narrowly, as, as broadly as you like. All right, I noticed we're just coming up to two o'clock, so I'd like to take this opportunity, unless there's any other um, questions there, but just this opportunity to thank you, Ibrahim, um, for your scholarship and your presentation today. And thank everybody who's, um, who's logged in today for the Twilight Network um, seminar, webinar. Um, if you'd like to continue to um, get notification of future events, the uh, best way to do that is either to follow, follow the Twilight Project on social media, um, or you can subscribe to our mailing list if you go to our website. So that's violet.anu.edu.au. So have a lovely day, everyone, and, and to you, everyone.